guns, one of the key factors that set Bloodborne apart from the other games in the Souls series. These weapons are mainly used for parrying enemies with a bit of chip damage thrown in, but some of them serve a different function. Many people have gone to the length of celebrating these unique weapons by beating Bloodborne with just guns, but today I want to take that one step further by using a specific gun that I've actually never tried, but always wanted to. I'm talking of course about the Gatling gun. This weapon looks awesome. It has a rapid rate of fire, but isn't really useful for parrying unlike many of its other gun brethren. It does make up for this in a few ways which we'll be exploring today. So I want to answer the question, can you beat Bloodborne with only the Gatling gun? Pretty simple rules, I can only deal damage with the Gatling gun. That's it. Now, I think there's one likely question that's running through your mind right now. But JK, isn't the Gatling gun in the DLC which you'd at minimum need to beat Vicar Amelia to get to? Well, yes, that is correct. So to make this run possible, I've had to do something I've never done in any challenge run before. I've used a somewhat unsavory method using a tool called Save Wizard to let myself start with the Gatling gun and also give the military veteran class enough strength to wield it off the bat. If you want to get a better idea of how this software works, I'd suggest checking out the beginning section of Baron's Castle's Can You Beat Bloodborne as a First Person Shooter video. Shout out to him for helping me figure this software out. He's been an absolute scholar and a gent as always. But anyway, we have our gun and we can wield it. The strength stat doesn't affect its damage as the Gatling gun doesn't scale with it, so that's why I felt it was okay on this occasion to just start with the strength to wield it, just to avoid a boring early game grind and get onto the good stuff. So how does this gun work? Well, you hold down L2 and you fire bullets. Simple enough, right? It continuously fires bullets until you let go of L2. It's a bit odd because a number of these bullets don't actually seem to connect. It fires out 5 bullets per quicksilver bullet used, but only one or two of them actually seem to connect with the enemy and do damage. It is also very hungry for bullets, and given that we can only hold 20 at the moment, a key mechanic we'll be using a lot is blood bullets. For those that don't know, this means I can press up on the d-pad to sacrifice some health to gain 5 additional bullets. So if I have 20 vials, that's potentially another 100 bullets, but I do need to keep my health topped up also. The good news is it's a 30% health sacrifice for 5 blood bullets, but I get 40% health back from blood vials, so it does still give me an additional 10% health return. For now though, blood echoes to buy vials and bullets are in short supply, and if the enemy doesn't drop enough blood echoes to cover the bullets I've spent killing it, I've actually made a loss. Also, the damage isn't amazing with this thing unupgraded, and it only has E scaling in blood tinge. We're going to need to get some bullets and find a way to increase our damage ASAP. I farmed these guys on the bridge and by this ladder for some blood echoes, bought some bullets, wasted them trying to kill these doom walls, and then finally grabbed our first bloodstone shard. I ran around and got a few more that are lying around in early Yharnam and upgraded the Gatling gun to a respectable plus two. I also found a reasonably good farm spot for bullets as this enemy takes just two bullets to kill, but drops four, so it's a two bullet profit each time. With our gun upgraded and 20 bullets in our inventory, it was at last time for our first boss, the Cleric Beast. We had a good start and managed to get that beginning of the fight stagger breaking his head. This fight did help me to realize a couple weaknesses with this weapon. First, make sure you lock onto the right place. The Cleric Beast has two lock-on points and shooting at the upper one, i.e. the head, does a lot more damage, so it's important to clarify which one you're locked onto. Secondly, the range. Moving too far away means you'll often miss shots, so mid-range is the ideal place to stand. Finally, never forget about this weapon's clarific hunger for bullets. I only got about half the beast's health off with 20 bullets. Thankfully there's some to grab in this boss arena, but this is something I'll need to really monitor like never before on this run. Eventually, Cleric Beast goes down after some shots to the head, and our first boss is complete. There's no rest though, as we book it straight into Gascoigne. Now, where the Gatling gun really shines is against human-sized enemies that can stagger, such as Pappy G's first phase. This part goes pretty smoothly, but phase 2 sees him lose his stagger ability. Is that a word? Did I just Gascoigne a phrase? Anyway, the damage is only about 27 a shot, which isn't great, plus he's a lot faster and more aggressive. Kiting him up these stairs seems better than trying to run around this graveyard and get stuck on the stones though. I also realised if I run out of bullets totally and keep holding L2, 
I get stuck in this position and leave myself vulnerable. After a bit of patience and a lot of dodging, I finally get the father to blow a gasket and we can now enter Cathedral Ward, grabbing the Blood Gem Workshop on the way. One downside about progressing here is that item prices rise ridiculously. The bullets went from 160 to 240 Blood Echoes, that's a 50% increase. Anyway, I level up Vitality and grab a few more Bloodstone Shards we can now access to get the Gatling Gun up to plus 3. Our next stop is Old Yarnum though, as I want to try and solve our ammo issues once and for all. Unfortunately, there's another Gatling Gun enthusiast who's going to be assaulting us for the duration of our time here, and there's a relatively tough boss here, so it'd be good to upgrade the Gatling Gun again before we proceed. I gathered some Echoes, sold a bunch of equipment, and purchased the Hunter Chief Emblem from the Bath Messengers. With the ability to go through this gate, we can now start getting some Twin Bloodstone Shards. There's two behind this octopus man, one on this cliff, and then two more each dropped by the scurrying beasts right here. There's also another in these woods just before Hemwick Charnel Lane, and then another four just a bit further along with a little exploration. Then there's another two from this scurrying beast in the barn, and lastly, two more on top of the barn. With all of these, we get the Gatling gun all the way to plus six, which should put us in a good position. Back to Old Yarnum, I sprint my way down, heroically avoiding all the enemies to save my bullets, sometimes getting them to leap down ladders to their demise. I unlocked the final shortcut of the area, and it's time now for the boss, the Bloodstarved Beast. Our preparation here paid off. The damage was pretty solid, and the beast did stagger at least a little. It did feel like it didn't know how to handle long range attacks, and I was able to knock off good amounts of health during its phase transitions. I didn't equip any antidotes, so I just had to heal through the poison, but overall, this was pretty smooth sailing. This beast may have been starved for blood, but it certainly wasn't starved for bullets. With this done, our ammo worries are over. So, no dancing around it, I am going to use the Come FPK Chalice, but I am only going to use it to buy bullets and blood vials, not for leveling up, as it would be pretty cheap just to savagely over level here and would kind of spoil the point of the run. Leveling up is not allowed using any echoes I gained from this, it's just to save time farming. I also went to equip a blood tinge gem I found. It's a 12.6% attack boost, which is pretty decent. I'll never whinge about more blood tinge. We're on a bit of a roll with bosses here, so let's move swiftly on to Vicarbonate of Soda Amelia. After one of my usual careless deaths, I had a really good run second attempt. Similar to the blood starved beast, Amelia didn't seem to be able to cope well with ranged attacks. But this fight had a different issue. Amelia starts healing herself when she's low on health, and I don't know if I was just unlucky, but she kept spamming the heal. I had thought I might be able to just power through and out damage it, but it was clear this wasn't going to work. So I went to grab the numbing mist readying myself for attempt number three. But confirming to me that I was in fact just unlucky before, she didn't use the healing at all on this attempt until right at the end when she was one hit from death. So I just, you know, I shot her. Amelia wasn't able to Ahelia herself, and if you ever wanted to Gatling Gunner yourself but haven't been able to, now you can live vicariously through me. Now, one thing I forgot to mention earlier is that at plus 6, the Gatling Gun now gets descaling and blood tinge, which uh, still isn't great, but it merits me putting some points into blood tinge for a bit of extra damage. We now progress the game with this cutscene where Master Willem, the crusty tosser, says blood about as many times as I said Drake in the Drake Sword video, and then we get the Blood Drunk Hunter eye for DLC access later. Now one thing we haven't added to our build yet is runes, so let's take on one of several gimmick bosses this game features, the Witches of Hemwick. There's not too much to write Hem about with this one. Run find the witch, shoot her a bunch, rinse and repeat, watch out for the cemetery shades. Easy boss as usual, and we do a nice little stock up after. Now, you might wonder, what runes are we going to use? Well, there's one in this chest here which is perfect for us, the Formless Odeon. We can also get another one from gunning down this helpful guy. Both of these runes increase the amount of Quicksilver bullets we can hold, so now we can have 27 honors at one time, a 35% increase to our capacity. I foolishly decided to go to Yahagul early by getting grabbed by a black sack, thinking there would be bloodstone chunks I could acquire, but they actually don't appear here until later in the game. Still, I could at least attempt Dark Beast Pal because that's always... fun. There's two main issues with this guy. The first 
is when he's charged up. His attacks have a huge range, and second is getting backed into a corner, which happened to me maybe a couple times, right when his health was low as well. This was a really different fight from usual. Normally, I go for his limbs to get him to stumble to the ground, but this time, because I could lock onto his head, that was my main target. On the winning attempt, I kind of managed to stunlock him by repeatedly breaking his head, leading to very few of his electrical attacks, because this seems to discharge him if you do it. A few more shots, and I rid this area of the Curse of the Black Pal. I speak to Soulfred about engaging in jolly cooperation. Obviously, I'll never do it, but I just like speaking to him. And now, we can give the password to Already Dead Fred to enter the Forbidden Woods. We first want to take the trip back up to central Yarnum though, so we run through the poison, climb the longest ladder ever, and enjoy a satisfying way to make fresh calamari. The main thing we want here is the Canehurst summon, so we can call the chariot to take us there. Now just to board the carriage and- Oh god, oh god, what- Okay, so we board the carriage and arrive at one of my favourite looking areas in the whole game. Wait, how long was I standing there? Was no one looking after these horses? So firstly, these blood liquor dudes drop blood-tinged gemstones, but unfortunately none that are stronger than what I've got already. However, the main price here is that it's the first place where we can grab some bloodstone chunks. I was able to grab one from here, here, and here. This gives us the ability to get the Gatling gun up to plus seven, and I suppose while we're here we could try Marta Ligarius. This was by far the most difficult fight on the run up to this point. Well, Part of it it was at least. Phase 1 is an actual joke, you can literally just stand there and hold the fire button and he gets staggered continuously. But then he buffs for phase 2 and the difficulty skyrockets. Have a look at some of this footage of me shooting him. Notice anything weird? In phase 2, he has a magic bullet deflecting shield. I'm not making that up, this is honestly what's happening here. So is this impossible with the Gatling gun? Well, not quite. You see, he is vulnerable for a brief moment when he attacks, but as we can only get one hit in, I think we're going to need to increase our damage quite a lot first. I'm going to come back to this, I think. So instead, let's return to the Forbidden Woods and head down to take on the Shadows of Yarnum. The good news is our damage is decent and they can be staggered. The bad news is that there's three of them. Also, I tend to get stuck running around this arena at times. The most important thing is when the transformation animation begins, lay into the weakened one hard to hopefully finish him off ASAP. I chose to take out the sword guy first as he tends to be the most aggressive and constantly tries to close the distance. With him down, I then quickly dispatch the fireball guy, leaving just the candle wielder. By far, the most annoying attack of this fight is the giant snake summoning in this end bit, but we managed to push through and gun down the last one with just four vials remaining. Without a shadow of a doubt, this was one of the most challenging so far. But there's no rest for us. This area isn't Bergen worth exploring, so we flip down into the water to fight Quelag's more attractive cousin. I thought I was going to absolutely rominate this, but these spiders are very annoying, both from a perspective of trying to lock onto Rom and constantly interrupting my attacks. The diving head slam they do does a surprising amount of damage as well. And let's not forget Rom's magic attacks, which also hurt. I also need to avoid Rom's head as the bullets do a lot less damage there. I found the best strategy was to get close and fire a couple of bullets, dodge and repeat. It got a bit more intense with the AoE attacks, but I still managed to power through and get a narrow first try victory. With this, we now return to Yaha Ghul, which is now going to be rife with bloodstone chunks. After a quick level up of vitality and blood tinge, I run to grab this chunk behind the statue this chunk in this gazebo, light this lamp, kill this little bugger for two more chunks, grab another two from this snatcher body down here, yet another two from another snatcher body, another two on the main street before I get assaulted by these monstrosities, two again in this little alcove off the main street, and finally the last two from this scurrying beast, giving us enough to upgrade the Gatling gun to plus nine. So that's the good news. But the bad news is we have to face one of my least favourite bosses in the game, the One Reborn. Now, I did die once to this boss, but I realised my error was trying to stay too far from it. On my second attempt, I got myself into a mid-range and I was able to avoid some of its attacks just by walking while firing. When I staggered it, it stayed down for ages, allowing me to take off a lot of its health. 
I had to get blood bullets ready, but it wasn't too much of an issue, and after a few more rapid fire blasts, the one reborn becomes the one unborn. I do not like this thing very much. We venture onwards to the lecture hall and gun down this giant, just because we can. Nightmare Frontier is our next stop. Annoyingly, I had no blood vials left, and even using the hunter's mark doesn't restock them, so my only option was to kill myself or sit through two loading screens by going back to the hunter's dream, which is what I did. There's not much to do here before the boss, apart from test out the Gatling gun on the first Winter Lantern we'll encounter. After unluckily dying once at the same time as it, I engage big brain mode and catch it off guard to show it that it's not winter that's coming, it's my bullets. So Amygdala. I don't even have a pun for this, just watch. absolutely brutal. I almost feel bad for it. Almost. I made a quick stop back at the clinic to gun down this lady with an obviously unpronounceable name and get myself a third of an umbilical cord. Hooray! We can now push forth to the last mandatory area of the base game, the Nightmare of Mensis. I absolutely gunned down some spiders and also this hunter on the bridge. He can normally be quite tricky but here I stagger locked him into oblivion. You probably know what's coming next. Mikalash. Another of these pretty annoying late game bosses in Bloodborne. There's a host of annoying issues, like the running around sections for example. The first encounter with him is pretty easy, but once we get into the second room, he decides to start spamming a cool beyond in a very irritating fashion. You can stagger him out of the animation, but I was out of blood bullets at this point, and trying to make blood bullets led to my death. So I came up with a new strategy, which I would use quite a bit during the remainder of this run. For the first phase, where Mikalash is more passive and doesn't use Call Beyond, I use only Blood Bullets to kill the mannequins and then to damage him. After that, I chase him into the second encounter, but this time I've got nearly 30 bullets in our chamber. I easily stunlock him into oblivion. It wasn't quite enough to get the kill, but luckily I managed to stick in a few more blood bullets and fire quick enough to stop him going for a cool beyond and turn him into a pile of Mick Goulash. Before we press on to the top, there's one more prize to claim in this area. I roll out the lift into this window first try with no problem whatsoever. Nope, definitely didn't spend 30 minutes trying to get this. We pull the lever and drop the brain on a chain that drives us insane in the membrane. This of course means we can grab the blood rock and at last upgrade the Gatling gun to plus 10. The other useful thing we can now access is this great farming spot. Getting the eye pigs to fight these shadows nets a lot of blood echoes, so if I need to level grind I'll be coming back here. Shut up Queenie, I don't care what you say, I'm not doing any chalice dungeons. Murgo's wet nurse. Kinda weird that this boss could be some people's final boss if they choose a certain ending. This one barely wets my appetite. It's a slow boss that has limited reach, especially if you stay at mid-range. It does have a lot of health, but it doesn't really matter. I literally just held down the trigger and walked slowly backwards for the first part of the fight, taking off over half its health. It then started the pretty annoying darkness attack where its clones attack you. It's not annoying because I was in danger of dying, it's more annoying because it goes on for nearly a whole minute. Once it's over, we continue the brutal assault of bullets and we put the wet nurse in a hearse. Now we could face German and finish the game, but of course there's some optional bosses and the DLC, so let's cover that off first. After some leveling up, we're back in Yahagul to grab the Upper Cathedral Ward key. On the way up there, I took a quick detour and nailed this drop first time. I'm, I'm not kidding, I actually did. This lets us go to the abandoned workshop and grab the last third umbilical cord. Great, just what I like to carry around on me. So back up above, we enter Upper Cathedral Ward grab the orphanage key, make some calamari only to receive instant retribution from said calamari's girlfriend. She really wasn't squidding around here. I got chased by some blue-eyed doom wolves, but thankfully they were defeated by their sworn enemy, a narrow doorway. Now that's gonna cost you extra. Celestial Eiffel 65 is generally not a difficult boss. 
The only thing that's even a minor problem is finding the real one in the first phase, but once I'm locked into it, it's pretty much game over. When it grows in size, it just makes it a bigger target and easier to hit. Soon enough, he blue dabba dee dabba dies. But of course, the blue man group was just hiding the real extraterrestrial boss in this area, Ebrietus. Now, okay, first attempt, I actually wasted a bunch of bullets right at the start, so I hunters marked out to try again. The second attempt was going pretty well. Actually, a lot of what worked with Murgo's wet nurse also works here, and the fact you can lock onto her head is perfect for our build. But I forgot that the boss arena is a finite space and got myself cornered for a tentacle slapping death. For the third attempt, things were again going well. She really leaves herself open a lot if you break her head, as well as during this phase transition here, but I got caught by the blood blasts which don't do much damage themselves, but the frenzy that comes with them is not a good time. I nearly got cornered again by the charge, but managed to escape and a few more headshots send this daughter back to the cosmos. She was the Cthulhu loser in this fight. Well, the DLC is looming, and this is usually where a lot of runs hit a brick wall. Surely that's not going to happen here, right? I'm actually pretty excited because I get to fight my favourite boss in the series, Ludwig. Or at least I was excited until this happened. My damage seems to have very much dropped off, or maybe his health and defences are just that much higher. In any case, I need to think about this one and do some other prep before I get back on the horse. In the meantime, there is one more base game boss I still have yet to do. Our old friend Legarius. Now you might remember from earlier, our issue with his phase 2 bullet reflecting shield. That issue is still there. But I did come closer this time. The problem is that there's only a brief window he can be hit in phase 2 and this means I often waste bullets. Realistically, I'm going to need to get my damage up as high as possible if I'm to stand a chance here. So after grinding those eye pigs from earlier, I now have 50 blood tinge. That, uh, that took quite a while. But anyway, this did seem to help. It was a weird fight. It lasted 7 minutes with 6 of those being me taking down the second half of his health bar. I was honestly shocked I had enough bullets and blood vials to get through. It was just running away, waiting for an attack, fire a couple shots and rinse and repeat. By far the longest fight of the run up to this point and probably the most annoying. Towards the end I got panicky and I missed some shots, got stuck on pillars and felt more stress as my supplies decreased rapidly. In the end, I narrowly pulled out the win with just one blood vial remaining. Martyr McFly has at last been defeated, that was genuinely tough. I'm sure there won't be anything else that hard in this run. With a boost to our attack power and also my self esteem, especially wearing this crown, I was ready to play horse once again. The damage difference was definitely noticeable, and before long we were at phase 2. Ludwig still has a lot of health, so this was far from an easy ride, but there were some good openings during his AoEs for damage, which was tremendously helpful, and we limb broke him at the end, which gave all the opportunity I needed to finish him off. He was silent here, I think his throat was a little hoarse from all that screaming. After a quick run back to grab the eye pendant, I decided to take out these really annoying NPC enemies. Although the damage and stagger was good as usual, I unfortunately got sniped by magic after killing one of them. Hence these guys being annoying. I came back and absolutely mowed down the second one and then proceeded up to the research hall. We've got the living failures to contend with firstly, and it's ironic because I myself felt like a living failure after just carelessly dying to them here. I forgot to look out for the projectile guys, that was my issue. The second attempt was a lot smoother, although they do have a lot of health. The meteor shower attack is nice, as it's a big window to get damage in. With enough dodging, healing and blood bulleting, these bulbous blue boys go down. With almost no rest, we've got Lady Maria next. Now for the first part of this, she is vulnerable to our usual stagger tactics, but in the latter part of the fight, she does gain some hyper armor which complicates things. She also did a follow up attack which I've never seen before, killing me during my first attempt. The second attempt was pretty messy. I often found that I couldn't respond quick enough if she started using one of her hyper armor attacks while I was firing. I took a lot of hits here. There were still some times where I was able to stagger lock her for a bit, which was kind of lucky, but my dodging was not on point. In the end, I had no blood vials left and one lot of blood bullets. Thankfully, I managed to survive long enough to get the kill, but this was really close. This was a towering challenge and we were against the clock, but in the end, victory was achieved. Just. Celestial dial in hand, we went into the ever fun fishing hamlet to fight slash run past some baby shark. 
do 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 baby. Of course, we got to face the boss of this area, Orphan of Coz. But before we get into that, let's chin off the other remaining DLC boss, Lawrence the First Vicar. Now, this boss is often touted as hard, sometimes even more so than Orphan, but not on this run. This was actually the easiest time I've ever had with Lawrence. He's another example of how many of these bosses do not know how to deal with range. Staying in mid-range and baiting attacks which are easy to dodge, followed by a quick bullet shower, is extremely effective. That's not to say there weren't a couple of hairy moments, but this was probably easier than Maria was. No prayers could save Lawrence from my shower of bullets. Now, back to Orphan. This probably won't be too bad, right? This might not surprise you, but I died more to Orphan than all the other bosses put together. That second phase just gets so chaotic, and his damage is huge. There's many of his attacks I just can't consistently avoid, and even if I hadn't died here, I'm not confident I would have had enough vials and bullets. I need to improve my ability to survive. So what to do? Well, I bet one thing you guys might be thinking about is Bone Marrow Ash, an item that increases the damage of the next shot from your gun. Well, guess what? It doesn't work. It does nothing to the Gatling gun for some reason. See? Same damage. Is there any way to increase my survivability? Well, yes. First thing I did is grab this pulsing damp blood gem, which recovers 4 HP per second. I can't equip this to my Gatling gun, but I can hold a weapon in my other hand with it. I think this is fair to allow, as I won't actually be doing damage with the weapon, it's just there to allow me to get that passive healing from the blood gem. I also did some grinding and got my vitality up to 50. Now did this help? Yes. Well, a little bit. Phase 1 I could get through with pretty much no issue, but the chaos of Phase 2 is just too much. I did make the realization that when Orphan charges the lightning attack, he takes less damage, so decided to use that time to heal instead. I died a lot, still, but progress was being made. I got just a little closer each time. I steadied my focus, avoided getting too greedy with my bullets. The final few minutes of the winning attempt was some of the most intense bloodborne combat I've ever experienced. I was down to no blood vials remaining and one hit from death, but I still had a good number of bullets. I managed to dodge many of his attacks laying in more and more bullets. He started summoning the lightning, and in a split-second decision, I decided to just barrage him with bullets and hope for the best. I did kill him at last, but I failed to dodge the lightning, so it was a trade, but he died first, so it counts. It caused me a lot of bullets, but there's nothing more fun than orphan. Just German left to do. Compared to what I just went through, he was extremely easy. A lot of the time he just walked towards me while taking bullets, even in his final phase. This was almost a nice relaxing breather in comparison to what I just went through. Okay, well let's take on the moon press. Wait, what? Damn, I forgot to eat the umbilical cords. Oh well, it's only moon presence, we can leave that, right? No, no we can't. I know for a fact there's going to be several people in the comments who will say this run is invalidated because I didn't do the damn moon presence. So I reloaded the last save state I had made, which was before I upgraded my health or got the healing gem. I absorbed the cords or whatever this is meant to be, killed German Monster for a second time, gave the moon presence indigestion, and proceeded to absolutely demolish it while it just stood around for large periods of time. Nightmare slain. Easy. You know what you get for Christmas in Bloodborne? Moon presence. So, this was fun. I've never done a gun-only run before, and this was a hell of a way to start. Orphan was pretty brutal, but I think that's always going to be the case, at least for me. Seeing some of these bigger bosses like Ebrietis and Lawrence brought down was really fun to see after the struggles I've had with them in previous runs. Want to see more Bloodborne runs? Let me know in the comments below. If you liked the video, make sure to subscribe for more content and to help support the channel. Until next time, I've been JK Leeds. See ya, and have a good one.